a very warm welcome, everyone, uh, to our fourth webinar in the Red Plus Monitoring and Measurement, Reporting and Verification Training, the training series. My name is Sarah Carter, and I'm representing Govsi Gold and Wageningen University, two of the organizing partners. This webinar series has been sponsored by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, FCPF, with support from other partners. For more information on the webinar series and for links to the materials which are going to be discussed in this webinar, please visit the webpage link which is shown on this slide. You can also contact me using this email address. By the end of the week, the recording of this webinar will also be available on our website so you can watch it again. This webinar is going to last for around one and a half hours. First, I'm going to give an introduction to the series, and then we'll have three presentations on community-based monitoring, which is the topic for today. Following this, we'll have a two-minute break where you can post your questions into the question box, and our pre presenters will then answer your questions. But you can post your questions anytime into the box, into the chat box that you see on the control panel. So first, to put today's webinar in the context of the bigger picture of red, plus MRV. This slide shows a number of tools and methodologies which can help you to negotiate the Red Plus MRV process. And um, our webinars are based around this slide. So we have Red Compass in the middle of the slide which helps users stock take where they are in the Red Plus MRV cycle. Um, and that was the focus of the first webinar. Technical guidance documents are available on the left-hand side, for example, the Gofsi Gold World Bank training materials, and you can download these materials or watch instructional videos on, the, on our website. And for those who are especially interested in the topic of community-based monitoring, you can find materials, exercises, case studies, examples, and videos on this topic. So please check those out. Also on the left of the slide are tools to help design Red Plus programs such as the decision support tool, um, the DST, um, which was the focus of the second webinar. On the right are the tools related to activity data, including BIODA and BFAST, which were introduced last week. In two weeks' time, webinar five is by Winrock International on degradation. Um, you can see that on the right-hand side as well, that topic. And webinar six will focus on uncertainty analysis, um, with Boston University um, and FAO. So they'll show you some of those tools which are also on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, webinar 7 will demonstrate CEPAL, a cloud computing platform, and this is for um, national forest monitoring systems. We included tools which will be presented in this series on this slide, but of course there are other tools available, available which can help you with your Red Plus MRV. So, um, to begin with community-based monitoring, um, I'm delighted to introduce our three speakers today. Arun Pratahast from Wageningen University. Um, we have Roxroy Bollas from WWF Guyana, who's unfortunately um, experiencing some internet problems in Guyana, so we're hoping that he can join us later. And we have Margaret Scutch from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. So, Arun, um, we'd like to begin with you, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. So, welcome everybody. So, uh, uh, topic of my presentation is community-based tropical forest monitoring using emerging technologies. So. In this presentation, I'll mainly focus how the technology can help to uh, implement this community-based forest monitoring. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the outlines. So I'll give some background because I know you are following this Red Plus uh, seminar. Oh, uh, uh, Red Plus uh, series of this uh, webinar, so you know already, but I'll just give you a small uh, context about Red Plus MRV and the need of community engagement in Red Plus MRV and the role of emerging technologies. And then uh, I'll try to demonstrate some uh, operational aspect how we can really design and implement community-based monitoring systems. And I'll also show some of 
the results from uh, different demonstration cases. So let's just start with the forest and people. So the inter forest and people are really interconnected each other, and, and over 1.6 billion of people's livelihood directly depends on the forests, and it might be more, just uh, one figure. And there was one paper published in a Science in 2008, which analyzed and then showed that the population growth around the forest areas. Is, uh, especially around the uh, and the protected area is higher compared to the rural area growth and it's almost doubled in these two figures you can see it's almost doubles in Latin America and Africa so it shows that lots of people are migrating nearby the forest and forest protected areas so once there the people uh, stay nearby the forest so there also the interaction between forest and, and the peoples are high and that means there are lots of uh, locally induced changes like uh, logging of firewood extraction charcoal or shifting cultivation these are some locally induced drivers of changes we have uh, these figures, of course, uh, there are lots of uh, issues, but at least we have this global uh, forest change map. And we saw that lots of forest from the green color, you can see the tree cover, whereas the red cover shows the loss. Let's ignore the other colors. So we can see that there are quite a lot of forest is still left in the tropics, whereas the red colors, also the losses are quite high along the tropics. And it estimated that around more than 2,000 kilometers square per year of loss of forest every year. So that's uh, really attract the international initiation to protect the forest. And that's why the Red Plus uh, uh, have been discussing over the past years to really reduce the emissions from deforestation and degradation, but also really engage the local community for the conservation, sustainable forest management, and enhance the forest carbon stocks. And the main mandate of this, uh, one of the main mandate of this Red Plus is really to engage and utilize the local knowledge in design and implementation of this Red Plus project. Because these projects are more, uh, most likely to be happen at a local level. So let's see how community can really contribute. So community can provide important data stream about MRV because they live uh, nearby their forest so they can visit to the forest they can collect uh, different uh, type of changes or like track the changes MRV means here I am talking about me M means measuring and monitoring R means reporting and V means verification I think most of you know already so in terms of RAID we need like uh, emissions which is just the formula calculated by activity data into emission factors. Activity data is related to the forest area change. You saw, uh, you heard from the previous webinar that activity data can be derived from the remote sensing, but we also saw how we can uh, get some activity data from ground. Where emission factors are mainly uh, calculated for the carbon estimation uh, by DBS and height measurements of the trees. Uh, so there are like clear things how we do the MRB, but there is no uh, clear guideline really how to engage the local community in this process. Uh, still, there are not clear roles and uh, uh, not a clear role and responsi uh, responsibilities for community-based monitoring. And there are a scarcity of tools that really supports or fit the purpose of uh, need for the community-based monitoring. On the other hand, if you see in the global scale, the technology era is really developing. So from the sensor side, you can see we have lots of ground sensors like mobile phone, social media. So there are all kind of ground sensors uh, are easily available at the moment also in developing countries uh, as well as in developed countries really to monitor the ground uh, observations. 
Also in the uh, space, we have quite a lot of uh, sensors now. Landsat is there, Sentinels uh, era, also this Planet Lab, also launching lots of uh, micro satellites. So there are lots of sensors increasing the uh, uh, space. And these sensors are increasing day by day. Where in terms of, terms of data processing and storage also, before we had the single computer, now we have the cl cloud computing. So there are like huge varieties of, uh, of processing power available in different levels. In terms of presentation of these results also, before we used to have the paper-based map or like a static web site, but now we have a dynamic web, also the social media is more prominent. So they're like this, all emerging technology are really progressing quite fast. And implementation of this technology in terms of participatory monitoring and management for, uh, in terms of, in context of forest, is uh, varying. So if you see in the global aspect, there are some examples where this all technology have uh, implemented and they have demonstrated. Whereas if you go to the local level or national level, the intensity of use of this technology is very low. So this triangle basically shows the technological development in global aspect for the local aspect. And uh, in terms of using this technology for forest and land use decisions, it's, uh, it, uh, it is very low at the local scale. So let's see for the mobile device, because mobile phones are uh, quite cheap and like let's say quite easily accessible. At the moment we have like more than 5 billion users in the world. It was the figure which I get in 2015, it might increase now. And 2 billion smartphone users out of them. And, and this trend is quite high in developing countries. So it's like really uh, more or less if you see uh, 2014 and 15 figures, so they're almost equal like developed countries and developing countries like the users of mobile phones, uh, sp smartphones. And these uh, smartphones have all kind of sensors like camera, uh, voice recorder, compass, GPS, that can really empower local communities to transfer their knowledge in a digital system. But still there is a bottleneck, how to develop an approach that can combine this technology for community-based monitoring. So that's why there are like three burning research questions. First is how can ICT support the community data collection process? Second is what is the accuracy of community collected data and how we can assess that? And third is how to integrate this data with the remote sensing or other uh, existing data source? So uh, I try to answer this question in three different sides of the world. So one is Vietnam, another is in Ethiopia and in Peru. So in Vietnam, uh, I work with a, a, a small ethnic community. It's in the Trabui commune. Whereas in Ethiopia, we work in the UNESCO Biosphere Reserves. It's called Kafa. It has uh, 800,000 hectares and it's the birthplace of coffee Arabica. And the participant was here, the local rangers. Whereas in Peru, we work in Hunin and Pasco province. Uh, we have three communities uh, participated and all are indigenous community. So these are kind of framework which uh, I developed to implement the community-based monitoring system, especially for activity data. So uh, first block, so it has four modules which I call like first model is near real time data acquisition and processing. What I try to do, I try to get uh, as quickly or as real time possible the satellite data for the area. So whenever there is new, let's say, Landsat images in that area, I try to get that image and then try to see what are the changes uh, in that area. The same way the community in the ground, they go to the forest and then they try to detect the change and then they send the changes, signal the changes from the ground. Try to, so this is called, this model is responsible for acquiring uh, ground data. Whereas there is the model where uh, storage and mapping, this is uh, responsible for storing the data in a meaningful way and then try to 
do some analysis like mapping and other things. Whereas uh, the presentation and interaction models uh, try to present the map to the end users or stakeholders uh, uh, to see what's happening uh, in the ground. And their social media provides the opportunity to discuss and really to uh, take some further actions. And this all system goes back to the community where they can get also the feedback uh, so it's uh, feedback about their sampling design, but it's also go to the uh, remote sensing methods where we fine tune the uh, remote sensing method based on the ground data to improve our near real time forest change alerts. So let's see some tools first for the community based monitoring. So uh, first we use uh, uh, traditional paper based system with the GPS. And then as the era of this uh, mobile phone and the Android develop, before you have like first time cyber tracker was first for Windows where you had this project, think uh, global act local, where they first time implemented the cyber tracker to monitor uh, forest carbon activities and biodiversity at some places. But then we had this Android era and then the Android phones had developed and then the ODK came, GeoODK, and the Sepali. So there are lots of other open source tools that help you to design your own data collection form. This is the simple data collection form which is in Spanish which show that how to collect like different variables of forest sense. But the most important thing also like not only to develop the tools, to really transfer the tools, teach the tools in an appropriate way. So that uh, so this photograph basically shows uh, the different capacity building activities, iterative uh, design of this uh, data collection tools uh, so that the, the people make less mistakes and they really understand what they can really enter. And also, uh, we have to think like uh, based on if uh, the audience or the participant is uh, uh, cannot read and write, then we can use iconography. And basically, uh, the Sepali is uh, developed by UCL, and it's very good for using the iconography for monitoring different uh, activities. So let's see. There's some results now. So this is the result about the carbon measurement. I think there are lots of literature you can find like that community can do almost equal job as the national expert for the carbon measurement. This is also one of the findings from the Vietnam case studies where we really try to compare the small things like number of tree count by expert versus the local communities, like tree basal area, above ground biomass, uh, time to complete the, the survey by experts and the local communities. So it's more or less one-to-one -one line, except you can see the times the local community needs a bit more time than the experts. And so it's more, uh, um, I think, more acceptable and also there are lots of other literature which show that community can do this. The big thing about the activity data, it's a still very, uh, confusing or like very difficult from remote sensing side to really monitor the forest uh, uh, well because uh, of the cloud cover different data gap in the remote sensing side. So the importance of ground data is quite important. However, the community have also the limitations because uh, community cannot cover whole study area. That's why we developed this inter, uh, integrated forest monitoring system where we can try to uh, give some signals to the community where to go uh, and so that they can target their uh, measurement in the area where there are some change happening. So this is the website. Maybe I can show you the uh, real website, how it works. Yeah, so this is the website where we have designed. Uh, I'll just show you like near real time sense. So what we do basically every month, we try to, we have, have fine-tuned the method 
we use the B fast. Oh, I think uh, two weeks ago there was uh, the presentation. Last week was the presentation about the B fast, how to use for a sense. So we use B fast to detect the change in this area. So this is the Kafa pass per reserves. So we try to detect whenever there is new uh, Landsat image, we try to grab that image and try to compare the image from the previous image to try to see where if there is some changes. And then these changes go to the uh, stakeholders and then uh, stakeholders either they can they if they decide so they, uh, they have free choice they can go anywhere but if they want to go in certain area like let's say this area uh, seems bigger change then they can uh, click here and then they can get their location in their GPS they can just dynamically like change locations so they they can get the particle location of this polygon or they can also get the location of all village. Kebele means here village and Warada means district in, Ethi uh, in Ethiopia at least. So in this way it helps them to really target uh, 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 to cover overall whole study area. So this is uh, we have uh, so this is now the ground observation which uh, is covered by the rangers and it's uh, running we established in 2012 and it is still running continuously. So every month rangers uh, uh, go there and try to monitor the changes. But due to security issues, they also like data security and like protection things. So we just want to show where the the people have visited, but we don't we don't show anything details about the local observation because it's a, so if you uh, anybody wants to look about the details how uh, the data look like, so for them they need to have like login control, and after that, so we use ODK for this. Uh, at the moment, I can show you uh, something. Will, I have to, uh, somehow it doesn't work at the moment. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so the hair basically it has the logging control, and based on that only you can. Can you refresh? So yeah, I just want to. So these are some forms. I just want to show you this one. So, so these are the data all come to the database server. So and so also the audio recording, video, pictures, everything comes to the database server. But it's the control of the authorities who. Uh, so only the authorized people can see and download this data. But uh, beside this, we also have this uh, Facebook group where we also, it's called near real time Facebook group. It's also a closed group where all the stakeholders, where the implementation agencies are part of this group and they also get the, uh, receive the message. So if somebody posts something, then they uh, try to take the further actions or they discuss about all these problems on this side. And we also, beyond the biocarbon uh, or like forest change, we're also implementing now the biodiversity monitoring. So people are also going, these are the frequency of observation within this radius. So we're also uh, uh, observing biodiversity uh, in this area. Let's go back to the presentation. So these are the, we call the interacted monitoring system because uh, if you don't allow people to see what's happening in their ground, then is, they can monitor but within the certain radius, maybe one kilometer or two kilometer. But if you give the perspective about, okay, at least in this case, we have the biosphere reserves, which is, which is 800,000 uh, uh, hectares. So it's like, it's uh, really easy for them to also target and see where to go. This is one example also, like from remote sensing, you can get the red dot, so that means you can get the change. But you you are not sure, like what is this, uh, the cause behind this change and like why it's happening. So in this case, like for example, the local people really give you the, uh, give you the interpretation. So for example, in this case, we detect something on the, 
unusual things going on this area, then people went to the ground and checked that is the slash and burning going on. So they really send you the pictures, evidence, and then it goes to the social media where the they disseminate the results with the other uh, participants or like rangers. And this was the one very successful case because the local radio picked this news and then they run half an hour program about uh, all this forest protection. So, uh, so this is the way how we can really reach to the policy makers or like protection agencies through this information. Then we think about, okay, so uh, local uh, people can collect the data, but what is the quality of data? How to really assess the quality? So especially I uh, talk about the temporal quality because temporal quality is quite important in terms of activity data monitoring. So when the forest was caught it. So we try to interpret the very high resolution satellite image and with local data to try to distinguish deforestation and degradation event. We found that surprisingly the deforestation uh, remote sensing was one or two, so these are the lag years, one or two years. So remote sensing was one or two years earlier than the local communities in reporting deforestation. Whereas in degradation, uh, uh, local people are like earlier than remote sensing, almost one and two years. Uh, it somehow su surprised me why, uh, because of course in degradation it makes sense because if people are in the ground for remote sensing it needs some time until the canopy have some openness to detect. Uh, but for deforestation, it was not making much sense. Then I went back to the community and asked and really investigate why it's happening. So it's also like not only the change, but also the definition issues. Because most of the case, uh, they entitle the land as a forest until the land use is changed. So if there is no tree at all, but the land is still belong to the forest department or government land, they call it still forest. Once they, it changes to the cropland, they start telling that it's a cropland. So this was kind of, uh, but uh, other things, we try to really uh, analyze both this data stream in a, in a systematic way. Then we try to find that, uh, especially in terms of a key red plus MRB question. So there are four MRB question which we think is uh, essential. First is, where is the forest change? So where can be answers by geolocation? Remote sensing have, uh, these sensors have really um, uh, systematic sensor. So the location uh, uh, on uh, grab or like provided by remote sensing are quite accurate compared to the local communities because local communities uh, are very good in their surroundings, but uh, uh, outside their surrounding, they are not so accurate. Now, how much forest is changing? So, uh, we saw that uh, remote sensing are quite good in detecting the larger area changes, whereas a small area change, remote sensing are not so good. And especially in Africa and Ethiopia, especially, the changes are really in a small scale, uh, less than 0 0.6 hectare most of the time. That was one of our colleagues find out. Uh, and uh, so in terms of uh, community, communities are very good in detecting a small area change. They can really map well, whereas in the large area change, due to terrain, due to different difficulties, it's difficult to map them. And timing issues, as I show you in previous slide, uh, the type of deforestation, uh, remote sensing are quite good, whereas degradation and remote sensing are still lacking. On the other hand, community are very good in detecting the degradation timing and deforestation, it, was, it is, has some issues of definition or different problems. And the final most important question about the cause of changes and you can hardly get this information from remote sensing, whereas the communities are very good in providing uh, the drivers of, uh, of forest changes. So what we saw that these two data stream are really not competing each other, but more uh, they are complementing each other. So if we can really uh, combine this uh, two system together, then uh, we can really establish effective forest mounting system.
And then third question is really mapping. So we also saw that it's still the big problem in mapping the forest change and especially the degradation mapping. So what we also try to do based on the reports provided by the local communities, we try to fine tune the remote sensing image and try to predict the deforestation and degradation. And we found that the results are quite good when you combine the local observation with remote sensing. So for example, these are the pictures where we uh, we saw that if uh, the cross uh, black crosses are basically like uh, you can see also like uh, plus is degraded and cross is deforested. So the red is especially the probability of deforestation and this uh, yeah blue uh, brown like uh, let's say I'll say blue <laughs> it's more like degrade, degradation. And so the degradation is always surrounded by the deforestation corner. And if you have more data in the ground, then you can detect more. The probability of detecting is higher. So in this way, this is the way how we can really integrate both this data set to map the forest sense. Uh, I think I'll give you some conclusion. Um, from my side, still there are some presentation is still remaining. So uh, I think that local communities are unique sensors for tropical forest monitoring. You have lots of space sensors, but these are really the communities are unique because they live there. And uh, as I show you in my first slide, that the population are growing, uh, and it was almost double uh, around the protected area. That means the sensors are really doubling. And so it's really empower to collect more data. And uh, with, uh, with this demonstration cases, what I found that community can really play active role in forest monitoring. Emerging technology really helps to transfer their knowledge in a digital system effectively. However, to really operationalize all these things, there is a clear need of incentive schemes, motivations, continuous training, and institutional cooperation. So these things, if we don't have, that means it might not sustain for long term. Uh, if you want to uh, look the details about uh, all these case studies, how I have done, what are the methods, the detailed results, then this is my thesis where you, you can also download and then you can also have a, a detailed look about uh, tools, code, results, data set, everything is open source and free. And there are some further readings which I included on this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Great, Arun, thank you very much for that presentation. It's good to hear about your case studies. Um, I'm pleased to welcome now Roxroy Bollas. Um, to present next. Um, we hope that the internet connection is going to be good enough. Um, he's joining us all the way from uh, Guyana. So, Roxroy, um, the floor now is yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thanks, Arun. It's um, nice hearing your voice after a long time. Um, so, I hope I can go through this um, presentation and I hope everyone is hearing me. Um, so I am um, actually presenting from Guyana. It's morning here and let me see how this works. Yes. Okay. I think um, my internet is part is it's, it's working. So just to give some perspective of where Guyana is in relation to the rest of the world. Um, uh, in back in 2009, um, how does the whole uh, CMRV um, thing was conceptualized is that back in 2009, the government of Guyana um, embarked on a, a scheme, they call it the LCDS or the Low Carbon Development um, Strategy. Um, there's a link there, you can check um, check it out. Um, but what they did, they embarked on this project um, that will, you know, 
enable um, sustained Guyana's development and prosperity through the following low carbon trajectory and to build uh, a red plus model that can provide the world with functioning mechanism to draw from. In the light of that, um, the Global Canopy Project, the IOCRAM International Center, and the North Rupununi District Development Board, which is a local board that governs uh, uh, an area within Guyana, they um, came, they put together a, the fourth CMRV project um, that was held um, in Guyana, and that was between 2012 and 2014. And uh, this project was totally uh, funded by the Norwegian um, Agency for Development and Cooperation, now run. Just to give you some perspective, um, the North Rupununi is made up of now 19 communities, uh, Amerindian communities that speak um, mainly Makushi, and it's it's mainly located in the central part of Guyana. Um, uh, to give you a bit of background information about those communities, um, it's, a, it's, it's now about 19 communities, and these communities are represented by their own village council, and um, it's a population of over 7,000 people in, in and around the area. And it's 90% indigenous, and mostly Savannah, and as I mentioned before, um, it's mainly Makushi. Um, and right now there is the influence of um, Portuguese and Spanish because of uh, migration from other neighboring countries. Now, in 2014 to 2016, WWF um, started in order, another um, CMRV project, and this is in a place called Conishen. It's actually the last part of, of Guyana, bordering um, Brazil. Again, this project was funded by the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Um, but this was mainly focused on one community, as in the previous 2012 to 2014 project, that was focused around um, 16 communities. Uh, just to give you some perspective of the location of where the the YY uh, project was located, it's in the very last part of Guyana. Um, now, one of the biggest things that was needed um, to make this project work was data, and how to capture that data was a big problem because of how vast the landscape um, is. So there were, there were a lot of um, consultations and meetings with the, the locals, a lot of training um, to, to, and to help people understand what, what the, the concept of the project, um, why, you know, they are chosen, um, the communities rather, and how they can play a part in helping gather this data. Mind you, the LCDS project, um, one of the key components was to do a national MRV. And as Arun mentioned in his presentation, from a satellite perspective, you can see much of the, the canopy but um, from a uh, degradation perspective, you really can't see what is going on on the ground. So having the communities be a part of providing that more or less close area ground shooting, that is where the CMRV project um, came in. So the aim was to have the communities do the CMRV project, and the information would have fed into the whole development of the national MRV and to fill some of the holes that the national MRV would not have been able to fill because they're doing it on a large scale. Uh, and one other thing that we had to do to 
bring all of this together. And again, we were working with 16 communities was to develop a monitoring framework. And based on the consultations and meetings with the communities, there were some key things that were highlighted and which were relevant towards um, a CMRV and relevant towards um, the national MRV. If, if you notice in my, I hope you can see the screen here. But then we have things that are relevant to the community, things that are relevant to the government, and things that are relevant to the international community. We have things like um, impacts, well-being, forest change, and natural resource. And these are the things that the communities also wanted to get a good understanding of what is happening in their community. So some of our approach was to take the, the communities that had already done their sketch maps. Um, what we did was we take those sketch maps and brought them into our GIS, and then we started to develop the various layers that will be needed to to bring all of this together in in, a, in, in in an electronic fashion, I should say. Another component, and Haroon mentioned in his presentation, he showed different levels of tools that were used to capture data um, from the past and, and to the present. But one of the things that we needed to tackle was how are we going to capture this large amount of data and doing it on paper would have not been the best option, although uh, economically wise it might have worked out better. So one of the things we decided to do was to embark on looking at the possibility of using smartphones for, um, for data collection. And uh, I'm going to what I'm going to get into now is showing you two approaches to how this was done. Um, the first approach is the GCP approach, which was between 2012 to 2014. Now, um, when the project started, it, it started with the concept of everything would be in the cloud. And I'm going to get into the pros and cons of the cloud and, you know, how it is viewed in this part of the world against other parts of the world. Now, this system is similar to what Arun was showing you. Um, they used a web-based uh, platform, which is developed by Google. Um, they, it's called the App Spot, and that enable for the, the processing of the data that was collected on the uh, um, smartphones. Uh, just to give you an idea of of how this worked, um, the data would have been collected on the smartphones and sent to a server that is somewhere in the cloud, and that data would be processed by the AppSpot aggregation system, and then it would have been visualized in the the office in the Rupununi. But one of the problem one of the problems on, that was faced is lack of internet. Now, the Rupununi is very remote, and not every part of Guyana, at this, even at this moment, have um, good internet connection. And I'm in the city, and I have been. Um, I was just emailing um, Sarah about possible internet problems that we are having. Now. The, the system that the GCP had set up was built mainly um, for you needed to have internet connection to be able to send the data and to be able to receive the data. Uh, mind you, the system worked well, but we, they, they had a problem with the internet. Another problem that they had with the 16 communities was the problem of the cloud. Now, at that time, no one in in that region know what the cloud is. The cloud for them was when you go outside and you look up in the air and you see, you know, whatever color those white things are or whatever color it is. That that is their understanding of the cloud. Now to remove 
um, you know, the whole confusion of the cloud. We needed to make some changes as we go forward in doing CMRV in Guyana. And I just want to share some of the experiences um, from the that project is that some of the key things that we 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 think needs to happen um, for any project, uh, CMRV project. Um, there needs to be clear understanding between the donor, the project leaders, or the implementers, and the community council. Now, there were some understanding of what the project is going to be, but some of the technology that was introduced to the folks was way above what they understand. Um, constant meeting needs to be carried out so that people understand the objectives of the project. and. Uh, because we were working with 16 communities and who has various backgrounds and different, um, you know, different information that they, they would like to keep secret from the other community. They weren't too happy with the whole cloud technology because they thought someone outside of Guyana, outside of their location, outside of their community, could look at their data. So we had to develop a data sharing protocol. And even though smartphones are, you know, good and it would help with the data collection and other things, it still poses a lot of problems, um, and some of which I will share later in my presentation. So moving forward, we had to develop a data sharing protocol. And basically what this is, is this AMBA, um, kind, of this kind of traffic light scenario where green data means the data that can be shared because it has received community approval. Amber data requires consultation to clarify its status and terms of use. And the red is data that is sensitive and cannot be shared. Or, you know, the process is, is in a loop. So as if the data is red, it means that if it's really needed to be shared, they would have to go through the different consultation and make that um, possible. Um, this diagram just gives an idea of how the, the data requests and the data sharing protocol works. Um, the focal um, the data sharing request is made here. There's a decision about whether this data can, you know, be shared or not. Um, the data owners, the community members, are the owners and represented by village councils, and it needs to go through them. Then they send it back. And it's a send the request or the directive rather is sent to the data manager with all the necessary documentation to release the data. Moving forward, uh, what we did because the internet was a problem and we needed to not have the data in the cloud because it was a big problem for the communities. They weren't. Yeah, they weren't too uh, happy about the whole cloud scenario. What we did at WWF was to develop a strategy um, using a local server that does not require internet. However, it can be scaled up. Now, if you're in an area where internet is not a problem, by all means, I would advise you to use internet because it makes um, communicating and makes, you know, um, showing um, of the data that is collected more free and more fast. Um, I, I, I like some of the ideas that um, Arun showed there in terms of using social media as another means of helping disseminate information. But for our purposes, because internet is a problem and the communities are very, very far apart from one another that we work with, it, what we developed was um, this scenario where in the office there's a, a, a computer that has um, a, a, an application. It's called a SMAP server. It's run on top of, of uh, Linux or Ubuntu at the, at the moment. And this does all the aggregation and, and so on of the data that after it's collected. Now, this works well because the community one of the things that they are happy with with this is set up is because they can at any given time come into the office and see 
their individual community data right there. And we have made it clear that the laptop that is being used as a smart server, um, it is not connected to the internet, so none of this information is sent to the internet. And just to, to explain how this works is the, 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 the forms are developed in Excel, and it is uploaded to the server that is within the room for testing. And once the forms are tested and they are clear, it is now able, the phones, the mobile phones are able to download the, the forms um, from the server, which is right in the room. Once the, the, uh, the community members go back to their community, they go back with their smartphone with the forms on it, and they collect their data. Now, when they come back um, to, to the office for you know, downloading of the data, all the data is downloaded right in the office. And no internet is needed for this. Um, and I like the, this idea also because you can take the laptop to any of the communities and you can download the data from them there also. I think um, by, I have worked on a project um, from Acre. And what they do, because they also have like a big park with a lot of communities, what they do is they walk with a laptop from community to community downloading the data. So that also help the communities that they are in to see their data before the data manager move from there and they can do cleanup and verification of, of the collection. So the SMAP server that I talked about works um, as the aggregate server. And it is free. It is open source. And again, um, it mirrors the same idea of what Arun showed in his presentation when he showed you the data, being um, how it showed up after collection on the app spot is the same thing with the SMAP server. Here you can see pictures that were taken for this record. And you have you can also have the GPS um, information show up here and things like that. <clears throat> um, uh, you also have here the map view. Now I'm going to get into this a little later in the presentation, but one of the plus of what Arun showed you against what I'm showing you here is the fact that once it's online, then you have the um, you have the ability to actually see the pink spots that you see here are the tiles for various layers of the world that has not that cannot be shown up here because the computer is not connected to the internet. Now, if this was online, then you would have seen a Google. I think um, it uses the OpenStreetMap as the background. Um, Map, map data. So because we are not online here, we cannot see this. Now, to give you an idea of some of the results, like from the data that was collected, um, the communities were able to develop graphs. Uh, one of the, the big thing and one that they really in um, like is the fact that community members can actually now see what the size or what the, the shape, the actual shape of their farms are. And um, this has really um, helped a lot of the members also to, even though they are given that the acreage of the farm, it helps them to be able to sort of like do things in a more systematic manner or a more controlled manner. Um, Another thing that came out of the, the, the project was each community was able to now have a detailed resource map. My, remember when I started off, I showed you their, their, their resource map was a hand-drawn map that they had. Now, with the data collection and the, the georeferencing of their um, hand-drawn map, we were able to develop proper GIS map that they can edit every now and then, that they can print when necessary for you know community meetings and or making adjustment um, to their communities. 
so in progress, what WWF has started in 2017 is a new project. It's called the Opt-in Readiness Project. And what this project really is about is, to give you a little background, the, the LCDS, initial LCDS project that the government started, the, the, the aim of that project was to uh, enable communities to opt in or to give a part of their community to keep it standing. And as Arun mentioned in his presentation about, um, you know, incentives and things like that, in, in this line of work, um, going into those local communities, many of them depend on the forest for their, their livelihood. And to tell them to stop cutting it or to stop, you know, doing what they're doing might be a harsh approach. So with this opt-in readiness project, what it does, it enables them to receive an incentive. So even if they are not cutting, they they can still receive you know financial gains for keeping a part of their forest standing. Now this project um, uh, that WWF started, that I'm leading on the the technology side of it, um, it aims to empower the the community to opt into Guyana's Red Plus program. Um, it, it aims at helping them to develop, you know, good carbon, car, carbon, um, I'm in a meeting, sorry. Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, baseline information available to for the long-term monitoring of the NRDDB communities. Um, capacity building. Um, one of the, the, the problems that you have, because the areas are so vast, um, what we, we, we thought it would be possible would be to train the communities on some of the key aspects on how to um, manage their, their, their forest, collect their data, develop the forms, um, you know, upload the forms to their phone, collect the data, and analyze the data. Um, it would help in the long run, and it would also help in this opt-in program that WWF is doing um, to for the communities. From the government perspective, this um, program um, that we are doing, um, it helped to a model replicable system for establishing CMRV in other title communities nationwide. Now, I showed you that we are working in the central part of Guyana, but there are other areas within Guyana that has title community that wants to be part of this program. So at the end of this project that we're working in, it's our hope that we can move from here with a, not, with a model, you know, to the other areas of Guyana and replicate this um, this system. And one of the key is the strengthening of the accuracy of Guyana's national MRV. So the aim of this also is to feed the whatever information the communities are collecting into the national um, MRV. Now, I hope I'm not going too fast, but some problems that um, we are having um, is phones are being stolen or lost by the, the persons collecting the data. Um, and because of no internet connectivity, the background map of the world does not show, which gives a weird view of the data. As I was showing you, the, the pink squares in in the presentation. Hi, Roxroy. Just to Hi. let you know, we have two minutes left for you to present, if that's OK. Thank you. Yeah, that is OK. I'm, I'm, I'm true. Um, so my aim is to, because we, we wouldn't have internet in those areas anyway, my aim is to uh, repackage the SMAP server to have the communities layer. So when the, the data is showed to the communities, they actually see their information. And also to develop a custom ROM. Um, so that the phones or the devices, the Android devices that are being used, would not um, would not be stolen by people because they wouldn't look um, like a regular phone. Um, I hope I didn't rush it, guys, but 
that is my um, presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks, Roxroy. That was really excellent. It's great to hear about the um, the project going on in WWF Guiana. So, thanks a lot for giving us that overview. Um, and sorry we had to rush you at the end. Um, I'd now like to introduce our third uh, presenter, Margaret Scutch from UNAM, um, and she's going to introduce some discussion points. We know that you've already posted some questions um, in the chat box, so uh, we'll answer your questions directly after this presentation, but do keep posting your questions if you have them there. So, Margaret, I'm going to hand over to you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you happen to be. Uh, my name is Margaret Scutch, and I'm one of the two authors of Module 2.4, which is about incorporating community-based monitoring in national red monitoring. And we're looking at it from the perspective of the country, which might want to uh, integrate community monitoring into the whole national red monitoring system. I'm not going to talk about the module itself. That's available everywhere. You can you can download it. But I wanted to. Talk, I want to talk about three, what you could say were meta questions, so more general questions. We've had some very interesting presentations this afternoon on the more technical side, particularly of using the, 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 the technology to integrate the data that communities develop. But I want to go back and ask some more fundamental questions. One of these is, what are the key advantages of using community monitoring within a national system? A second would be, why would communities be interested to do it and what could encourage them? And the third one, to take it a little step further, is the relationship between community monitoring and benefit sharing, which is a topic which we haven't really addressed very much yet. Now, when we look at the key advantage of community based monitoring from the point of view of a national um, uh, red monitoring system. Um, I think what it does is it allows, you can never have community monitoring over the whole country. Obviously, you only monitor with communities where communities are actually using the forest in some way. So what it does is it generates little rays of light for the national um, system, which gives accuracy which is much, much higher even than tier three, and it can be annually uh, repeated. What it does, as Arun also pointed out quite well, I think, and, and interestingly, is what it really does is gives data on degradation and forest enhancement. It's much more difficult to get data from it on actual area change because of definitional questions and those kinds of things, which Arun also mentioned. What it does is generates data on change of stock, and that's really what it's uh, uh, um, important for. Um, now, while it could be used to densify national data, be integrated into national data systems. I think that there are some problems with this also technically because of the different scaling problems. And we approach this, we address this also in the, in the, in the module. You can look at that. What I think hasn't been mentioned yet, but I think is really important, is that community monitored data is especially important where you start to implement red strategies because it enables you to see precisely what happens when you introduce this change, when you say we are going to take the cattle out of the forest or we are going to introduce um, wood, wood, um, more efficient stoves or we're going to introduce reduced impact logging. You can measure, you can get data on the ground for exactly what the impact is on the carbon stocks. And I think that that aspect of community monitoring is one of the most important and one that hasn't really been addressed yet. That it's like using a, a red intervention as an experiment and monitoring the experiment rather than trying to monitor for the whole picture across the country. But it's very important for national policy because it helps you understand the impact of a particular intervention. Now, why might communities be interested? Um, one of the reasons why they're often not interested is because in order to be useful, the data has to follow a standardized protocol. It's very difficult to use, if everybody monitors in a different way, it's very difficult to combine the data. And communities monitor because they're interested in specific things. Now, they might be interested if they were going to be paid for, for say, the carbon savings on the basis of how much carbon they'd saved. But as I will mentioned in the last part of this uh, short presentation, there's a tendency, if you pay people for the carbon they save, for them to exaggerate in their, monitoring, in their monitoring how much carbon they have. And it also, as I'll explain a little bit later, it also 
tends to penalize those communities which had been uh, conserving their forests in the past more than those who had been exploiting their forests in the past. Um, so probably a solution to that is in fact to pay the community actually for doing the monitoring work. Quite apart from whether they get paid for carbon or anything else, they should be perhaps paid to actually monitor because this is a useful thing for government to know. It could also just be made a, a condition for participation in any red activities, but you know that means it's a cost to them, it takes time for them, and it might discourage their participation, so we have to think about that. But of course, it might also help them if they're already doing some kind of monitoring, for example, for biodiversity or some other kind of variables besides carbon. It might be uh, interesting from, to find some way to integrate carbon monitoring. It could be done, but I think those are questions we have to think about. Why, why should communities be bothered with all this, and what could we do to encourage them? Finally, I want to talk just briefly about the relationship with benefit sharing. And when I'm talking about benefit sharing, I'm talking about how the money from RED is distributed. And there's been a huge debate on this internationally, what systems should be used. It is often thought that because RED is a performance-based system at the national level, that it should also be a performance-based system at the community level, and that communities would get paid in proportion to the amount of carbon they save. Um, which would call an output-based payment system. But this is by no means the only option. In fact, in many cases, people are being paid by their inputs for the kind of activities. They're paid to do certain activities which are thought to lead to carbon savings, rather than being paid for their actual outputs in terms of what the carbon savings really are. And there are many, many advantages for um, using a payment by input system. Now, for example, Nepal, which is one of the three case studies we present in the, um, in the module which you can look at, Nepal uses a system of output payments, although it's weighted so that communities which are poorest get paid more per ton of carbon than communities which are richer. Within the community, then, those, though, that money is divided equally between the individuals. But I'd like to point out that the only reason it's possible is because what they're measuring is increases in carbon. They can't measure decreased deforestation because they don't have any data from the past at the community level. So it's much easier to measure increases in, in, in forest due to forest enhancement. It's very difficult to pay for avoided deforestation on the basis of, of, of performance because you need this historical baseline at each community level separately, which is very expensive and time consuming. And it also means that communities that have deforested hugely in the past would be in a position to gain far more money by stopping that now than communities which had always conserved their forests, which is one of the, one of the really bad things about payment uh, by, by performance. Also, communities never know when they start how much they could possibly earn, because they don't know what the results are going to be if you pay them by output. Whereas if you say we're going to pay you to do this and this activities, then they know clearly what they're going to get at the beginning. Apart from anything else, but people say that, okay, well, you don't need a baseline perhaps for every community, you need a baseline for a, a whole region, and then you can see what's happening. But this is very, very difficult. This is just an example to show this. Suppose we have 100 communities, adjacent communities, that are represented here by these 100 boxes. And in year zero, there's forest everywhere. Now, let's suppose there's a 3% annual deforestation, which means that three of these communities would, the equivalent of three of communities, would be deforested in the end of year one. And at the end of year two, without red, you'd have another 3% loss, so you'd have six boxes of forest lost. Now, let's say that in year one we introduced red, and we were able to bring down the deforestation rate from 3% to 2%. So now we have 2% deforestation, only five boxes have been deforested instead of six. But which was the one that hasn't deforested? Which of those communities has not deforested? How do we know who to pay? It's really virtually impossible, and this is one of the great difficulties in paying by, uh, by performance in red. Um, Input payments is, in fact, a much easier way to go um, um, for that. It doesn't mean to say that communities don't need to monitor. They need to monitor for other reasons, but they don't necessarily need to monitor in order to be paid. The advantages are they'll know how much money they'll receive. It's a much less conflictual kind of payment system. And in fact, most PES systems actually use this model. And as regards dividing those funds between members of the community, rather than monitoring how much each individual has achieved on his own piece of land or anything. In my experience, communities, given the choice, 
they opt for equal payments. Sometimes they opt to, to have some money given to the community as a whole for community works, but otherwise they opt for equal distribution, which seems to suit people much better. Um, that's what's going on in Mexico at the moment, for example. The plan there is to run RED as a sort of sustainable development program, sustainable landscape management, in which communities will get upfront payments to carry out certain uh, activities which will result in more sustainable forest management. They don't have to monitor individually. They may monitor, but they don't have to. The change in deforestation rates is assessed at a much broader, at the state level and international compensation will be um, uh, obtained to cover that. If communities do do their own monitoring, they will be able to sell any credits they have for forest enhancement, in other words, for increases in, 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 in their forest um, uh, biomass, that they will be free then to sell on any um, um, carbon market they choose. And this is in part because deforestation is in, at the moment illegal in Mexico. So um, while monitoring is not uh, required, it is certainly being promoted in the sense that it gives people an option for a different kind of red outside of the immediate national program. Well, those were the points I had to make. I want to leave space now so there's time for people to ask questions. Um, so let me end there. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm sure you've given a lot of people thought for discussion there, um, and we already saw that people have been posting their questions. We have a lot of questions to consider, but right now we're going to take a two-minute break. Um, please take the opportunity to type your question in the question box if you haven't done already, um, and we'll see you in two minutes. Hey, welcome back to the webinar, everyone, um, and thanks again for sending in all your questions. If we don't have time to answer your question now, um, please feel free to send an email again to the email address um, on this slide, and we'll do our best to get an answer for you. Um, so, Roxroy, I'm going to start with a couple of questions for you. Um, we have a question... Um, from Abraham Ngu, who is asking us, um, how long from the first consultation meeting to the first data connect collection in your project? So maybe you can just give us an idea about the, the timing uh, involved in setting up these projects, Roxroy. <coughs> OK. Um, um, pretty tricky question. However, uh, it, it all works out or it all comes down to how smooth the, the, the consultation meetings are going. Um, I guess if you set if you set out a time frame as to a time frame and a schedule as to what needs to happen in terms of leading up to the force um, collection, um, that would work good um, work good for you. But for an example, like this new project that we're working on. Um, the actual collection, the actual, the, uh, the the project started in October, the forest, but the actual collection was not done until I think um, the beginning of November because we had to do like um, training within that one month period. So it all comes down to what sort of mechanisms you 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 would be putting in place to. Uh, help uh, in terms of the, the persons who will be collecting the data, uh, bring them up to speed and, and things like that. So I would say uh, a month, a month after would be um, an appropriate time. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. Um, I'm going to go to uh, a question for Margaret now. Um, and a couple of people were asking, uh, um, about who is paying for community-based monitoring. We had Claudia Deschamps um, and also Gabriela Fuentes who is asking this question. So maybe you can say who's paying. Is it the government? Are the local communities paying themselves? Right. Um, oh, wait. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't think there can be any single rule about how that could be done. It depends on how the RED program is being run. Um, 
ideally, of course, it would come out of the, uh, if you'd done at national level, it would come out of the red funds that the, the, the country is earning on, on selling the, um, on the, rec uh, the, the money they get for the red. I don't, um, it, it depends, if a community is going to measure, shall we say, their forest enhancement, the increase of their, of their, of their forest density, and sell that on a private market, then it's a cost of production of the carbon, and it's clearly the, the community itself that would have to pay that. If the government asks them to monitor because they're interested in other questions as well, then I think it has to come out of um, uh, some other, other national funds. But that it will depend entirely on on um, on what's it, what the situation is and how the red pro program is running. I, I can't really give a simple answer for that. I'm afraid. Okay, great. Thanks, Margaret, for giving an answer to that. Um, and now we have a question for Arun, um, and we have a question from uh, Tadishi Shimizu who is asking us, what kind of background knowledge does a community need um, in order to be involved in this kind of thing? And maybe you can also give us some information about you know, how long it takes to train, how the training process goes, who, who from the community can be involved in these kind of things. So Arun, can you say something about that? Yeah, thanks for the question, Tadashi and Sarah. They, well, it depends on the community. So first, we really have to the process start first. We really have to assess their knowledge. So some community, let's say, in, uh, we have uh, I have worked in three communities in Vietnam, Peru, and Ethiopia. It all have different kind of knowledge. So in Vietnam, we have like really indigenous community. So they know uh, the they know about the forest but they don't know how to transfer for their knowledge in the digital system. So for example, they don't know what is deforestation, what is the definition of forest from FAO or national level. So we really have to convince these things. So in terms of experience, I think for the local local level, it doesn't need any experience, but you need to build the experience slowly. So first we really have to think like what kind of a participant or like a user are going to monitor if they and what kind of data we really need so if the uh, communities have no education level or like very basic education level then we have to design the form in such a way that they can still contribute so they can, for example, voice recording, they can still record uh, uh, and give the information through their uh, voice. They can take the pictures. And uh, so, and if they are knowledgeable, let's say, with some basic education, then we can also introduce like uh, uh, other type of questions, uh, like they can type, they can explain things. So it's always, uh, we, it's really need to assess the community first and then try to uh, develop the technology which really fit for their purpose. That's why it's really important. Another thing is training. Training is very important in whole the process. You really have to uh, train iteratively, not only like one time, it's like many times. Also, we need to give really refresher training time to time to make sure that they really understand all this system very well. Thanks, Arun, for clarifying that one. Um, Roxroy, we now have a question for you. Um, and Edna Faye Kimenju is asking us about the SMAP um, application. And uh, this is something available through Google, perhaps. Um, and is it something which you used in Guyana and is openly available? So if other countries want to use it, can, is that possible? Or do you know if it's not open source? Um. Uh, the the good news about SMAP is that it's open source. Um, the good news, another the good news, is free. And it's developed by guy in Australia that I've worked in um, for a number of years and it is extensively used in the marketing. I don't know. Um, I Sorry, Roxroy, we're losing you a little bit, but we got the message that it's free and it's open source, so I think, yeah, thank you for clarifying that question. 
Um, and we have another question um, for Margaret. Um, maybe Margaret, you can read the question. <laughs> okay. We sorry. Yes. Okay, we have a question from Abraham Gu. Uh, he says, um, do you know of any cases where communities were ahead of the game as compared to government on, on for MRV? Um, well, I do know a number of communi communities that have been monitoring, but not really for carbon. Uh, I know a number of communities where they are interested in other things, that's like biodiversity, or particularly in, in Mexico, for example, one of the things is monitoring for, for pests and the spread of pests because there are a number of, of parasites and so on. Um, but usually I have to say this is where communities have been helped by uh, by NGOs. It's, it's rare that communities, well communities I think do monitor but they don't write it down unless they're encouraged by organizations to record this data in other ways. Communities of course monitor, that people monitor everything all the time but it's just not called monitoring because it's not a formal activity. And maybe I can take the other question very quickly from uh, Tadashi. Uh, where you asked about am I referring to ajidos? Yes, basically they are ajidos. There are other types of communities but they're very similar to ajidos too, so yes. Great, thanks Margaret for answering both those questions in one, that's great. Um, now we have a question for Arun and we have a question by, um, we're just looking for the question here, uh, Freddy? Uh, Freddy Argotti is asking us, um, Arun, do you have the survey which you used for the monitoring um, and are you able to share it? Yeah, yeah uh, you can definitely use it. Everything is uh, freely available. So uh, I can also send you all the form which I have used through the email or like I can share with Sarah. Great, I think people will be glad to hear that. So thanks Arun for being willing to share your data. Um, we don't have that much time, but I think we have time perhaps for one more question. Um, and we have a question. Um, yeah, um, for Arun asking about the reliability of the community-based approach, um, also about the reliability of the mobile devices and the GPS. This is being asked by Mahmoud, Musa Mahmoud. Uh, maybe you've already answered this to some extent, but perhaps you can just uh, say something more about it. Yeah, yeah thanks. So real, reliability, it's a bit difficult, Trump. <laughs> Uh, like uh, how, uh, how you can say reliable, who is reliable. But at least what we saw, uh, like the quality assessment, what we do, uh, did in one of the case study in Ethiopia, we really want to assess the uh, reliability of this data with uh, a different data stream. Um, we found that uh, uh, it's uh, reasonably good enough. But uh, of course, uh, uh, it depends. You really need to. Uh, that's why, like continuous uh, motivations, training, and really feedback in, uh, uh, is important to really improve uh, uh, improve the errors or like misunderstanding in the data. Uh, about the GPS accuracy of the mobile phone. Yeah, it's the issue, but uh, it's not the big issue at the moment because uh, all our cases, what we found that the accuracy of uh, a smartphone GPS varies from 4 to 12 meters. So it's still it's good because we use the land set with a 30 meter uh, pixel size. So I think it's a still reasonably accurate. And there are also some apps which uh, can use to uh, calibrate the GPS of mo uh, mobile phone. Uh, for example, GPS stat. So, yeah, I think uh, the, it's an issue, but uh, it's not a big issue, actually. Great, 
Great, thanks Arun. Um, now we really are running out of time, so I'd like to thank the presenters once again for um, sharing their knowledge with us and also I'd like to thank all the participants uh, for joining us and for um, sending in your questions. Um, we have um, some more webinars coming up, we have a break next week and then there are three webinars. Um, so please do register on our website for those. We have one on um, forest degradation on the 30th of May, then on area and accuracy assessment on 6th of June, and on data management and analysis for national forest monitoring systems. That will be on the CEPAL system on the 13th of June. So we hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone.